Okay, the dreaded tangent problem. Now, it's not the pi over 12 that's really the problem here. It's the fact that that tangent formula for your sum formula and as well as your difference formula is a real pickle because you're dealing with the fraction there along with the plus and the minus signs and all that good stuff. So, um, as many times as I've done this problem, it always still gives me pause when I look at it. So, first thing we got to do before we dive into it is just get our heads wrapped around pi over 12 and how much that actually is worth. Um, you go back to your unit circle, pi over 12, well, pi over 12, that's half of pi over 6, right? Cutting it right in half. Well, it's just like cutting 30 in half, so really you're looking at 15 degrees here for pi over 12. So we can get there by taking 45 and subtracting 30. And like I said in class, I mean, the ratios don't care whether you're doing the work in radians or degrees. So um, just do whichever one comes natural. So I'm going to deal with degrees here. Tangent of 45 minus 30. All right. So let's make sure we're using this formula properly. Because there's a minus sign here for my difference for tangent, going over here, if I have a minus sign, that means I'm on the bottom, so every sign I have to use needs to come from the bottom. So minus on the, in the numerator, and a plus sign in the denominator. All right, so here's how this is going to look. We shall have here the tangent of 45 minus tangent of 30 divided by 1 plus tangent 45 times the tangent of 30. Okay, so we're still not at the tricky part yet. We're still pre-unit circle work here. Our unit circle can take care of all these tangents. So then we arrive, tangent 45, that's 1, minus tangent 30, that's the square root of 3 over 3. And then we have 1, Remember that this tangent here is just 1 as well, so you're really doing 1 times a square root of 3 over 3. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to write this as just a plus square root of 3 over 3. Remembering that there is a 1 times that there, but it really doesn't do anything here in the grand scheme of things. Now, this is the part where it really starts to get messy. So I've tried to give you a three-step process on how to do this. And if you do them in this order, it should work out rather well. Um, step one, get a common denominator. Note that your fraction within a fraction here, you have two things separate here by a minus sign, right? Let's get a common denominator and write that as one joint fraction. Let's do the same thing down here. Now, one is awesome when it comes to fraction work because it's easily shapeable into any common denominator you want. So what we're going to do with this thing here is why not treat one like it's saying three over three. Same deal here, it's saying three over three. So now we can write this as one fraction on top and one fraction on the bottom. So take a gander at what we have here. We have three minus the square root of three, all divided by three. And then in the denominator, we're going to have 3 plus the square root of 3, all divided by that same 3 down there. Okay? So step 1, common denominator. Done. We've got our common denominator in the numerator and the denominator. Step 2, let's multiply by the reciprocal. Realize here you have a fraction within a, within a fraction. So if we take this fraction, leave it alone. And then we can take this fraction here and flip it. We can multiply by the reciprocal. A lot of wasted writing there if you think about it. It's kind of confusing. But let's just rewrite this thing here. I'm going to keep this the, the numerator the same. So 3 minus the square root of 3 over 3 times the reciprocal here, which now becomes 3 over 3 plus the square root of 3. Now, by multiplying by the reciprocal, step two, take a look at the good news we have here. Threes. Gone. And now what we're left with here is three minus the square root of three divided by three 
plus the square root of 3. Step 2 is finished. Step 3. Multiply by the conjugate. Now, conjugate, conjugate, conjugate. It's a blast from the past there. It's been a while since we've dealt with that. Remember, the one of the other issues that we have here is that you have a square root in the denominator, which is not good. we got to get rid of that to have a rational answer. So, conjugate, remember what that conjugate was, was taking the opposite of that second part right there. And still leaving the first part, the first term there, the positive 3, leave, leave that alone. So, backpedal here. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 3 minus the square root of 3, top and bottom. We keep it the same in top and bottom because we're really multiplying by 1 here, right? This is just nothing but a big 1. And if we're going to multiply everything by 1, no harm, no foul. We keep the fraction the same. Now, why do we need to use the conjugate? The reason why we have to use the conjugate is because the square roots can cancel out that way. If we multiply by the exact same thing with a plus sign in there, then we're still going to keep that square root in there. We've got to get rid of it. So, the best way to multiply these things together now is FOIL. So we do first times first up there. 3 times 3, there's your 9. Outside, you get negative 3 square roots of 3. Inside, hey, you get a second negative 3 square roots of 3. And then last times last, square roots cancel. Negative times a negative makes a positive. And then you have a 3 right there. Let's clean this up a little bit. Realize that we can combine these together, the negative 3 squared to 3. We can combine the 9 and the 3. And here's what we get. And there we have it. The 9 and the 3 made a 12, and then the two negative square roots, 3 squared to 3 combined together give you negative 6 squared to 3. Now what about the bottom? Because these were conjugates, one of the awesome things you get with this is that the middle terms cancel out. I talked about FOIL in class. The great thing about that is the OI. The OI in the middle cancels itself out, which is great. So all we have to worry about here is first and last here. So 3 times 3, that gives you the 9. Remember, note that you have here the uh, middle, the OI, the outer and the inner cancel out because you have 3 rad 3. Outside, you'll have negative 3 rad 3. Gone. And then last times last, you get a negative and then 3 right there. Combine those together. What do you got? You got a 6. And then the last move, which sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't, that's why I didn't count as one of these three steps here, is that if you notice the 12, the 6, and the 6 down here, you can reduce the fraction. And when we reduce this fraction, now we have 12 divided by 6, which is a big 2. 6 square roots of 3 over 6, well, that's just a square root of 3. And there, finally, is our answer. Okay. Let's wrap up this note sheet by looking at the other side with these trig identities here. Now be prepared on test day to possibly get one of these ones here. I'm going to chalk this one up as one of those level two. Level two. And it's, you know, on, on test day I'll give you a level one. Uh, pretty easy, straightforward trig identity. And then we'll go to level two, which may be a little bit more challenging. These ones here we got to use our sum formula for sine. That seems like the, the best way to go. So don't forget, let's get a line going here just to remind ourselves not to move to the other side. And so when we use our sum formula for sine, here's what we have. And there we go. Now we can simplify these. What makes these a little bit different from previous identities is that they decided to put numbers in there. And instead of just variables and unknowns here, we have the sine of 90, we have the cosine of 90. You know what? We can probably simplify that, couldn't we? Sine of 90, I believe that's 1, isn't it? So we really have 1. 1 times the cosine of A. So I'm like, count from Sesame Street. 1, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Plus cosine of 90. Wait a minute. Didn't I have a unit circle back here? Cosine of 90, the x coordinate right there, that's 0. So we really have 0 times the sine of A. 0 times anything. 0. So that's gone. So now notice all we have left here is 1 times cosine of A, which is the cosine of A. Proved it. Let's look at this one. 
Ooh, this looks challenging. You know what I'm probably going to do? My instincts tell me to probably not mess around with that left side. That left side looks pretty short, compact, um, already simplified. We always want to work with the more complicated side. So, yikes. How's this going to go? Let's change everything into sines and cosines and see how far that gets us. So now we have everything in terms of sines and cosines. Now, unlike the work that you guys were doing on the previous section, 7-2, and maybe even, uh, oh, and then 7-2, you know, it, this is not looking right to me. If I look at this here and I say, okay, cosine over sine and sine over cosine, ooh, they cancel out and we get really, really excited. But let's think like that chess player. Let's hold that piece and look at the board if we were to do that. If we were to do that, notice that this would all cancel out. We'd be left with a 1 in its place, which would ultimately end with a numerator of 0. And 0 divided by, forget about what's underneath here, it's going to be 0. So what went wrong? Let's back it up. What makes these problems a little bit different from the ones you do in 7.2 is note that we are actually using two different variables, x's and y's. So what we need to put in here are the x's and y's. Remember, we could get away with it before because it was the same variable all the way through. So cotangent of x would be cosine of x over the sine of x here. Let me put that in a different color. Oops, messed that up already. X. And then over here, we're going to have Y. Sine of Y, cosine of Y. Down here, we've got our X. And then we've also got a Y here. Okay, so now let's move forward with this. Do you notice now that this stuff right here actually does not cancel out because we don't have the same angle measurements? Ah! So let's proceed here with that fact in mind. Because those won't cancel out like they have in the past because we have different variables, let's see what we have now once we start to combine some of these things together here. Um, the only thing I notice here is that we can just write that as one fraction, which is kind of boring. We just have here cosine x times the sine of y all over um, the sine of x times the cosine of y. Down below, we can write that as one fraction already. We have 1 over the sine of x times the cosine of y. Now, what do you think we could do here? One possibility is taking a good look at that 1 and trying to get a common denominator and combine those together, which you'd have sine, co sine x cosine y over uh, sine x cosine y. We could look at it that way. Um, let's just remind ourselves what our target here is. We're trying to turn this into sine of x minus y. You know what I'm going to do with this? Let's work this side. Just make, this might give us a nudge in the right direction. We want it to say the sine of x times the cosine of y minus the cosine of x times the sine of y. Right? That's what we're aiming for. That's what the formula sheet tells us. So, Thinking ahead here once again, what if we were to just multiply by the reciprocal right now? Come over here and multiply by sine of x cosine of y and then realize what we have now which is this entire quantity here times that sine x cosine y, which begs us to do the distributive property here and there. So what happens when we do that? Notice what we get here first. So we get the sine of x cosine of y because we're just taking that and multiplying it by 1. Now what's going to happen here when we take this red fraction here multiply it by cosine x sine y over sine x cosine y? Well, the sine x cosine y's are going to cancel each other out, aren't they? leaving you with a minus sign and cosine x sine y. 
we did it.